Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us for SPIRIT, the stimulating program initiative for retirees that inspires thought. I'm Judy Steinig, Director of Community Services for the Orthodox Union, and it's my honor to host and coordinate this program. The OU created SPIRIT several years ago as an on-site program, and now we are happy to bring it back as a virtual program because the OU recognizes that as the generation of baby boomers leave professional responsibilities, they're looking for all sorts of educational stimulation. And SPIRIT's goal is to provide active retirees, not yet retirees, empty nesters, baby boomers, sandwich generation pa parents, and seniors with opportunities for spiritual, educational, and intellectual growth. Now, of course, that we are, know that we're all staying in because of the coronavirus, and what are we going to do? Well, spirit is the perfect way to engage everyone in a virtual setting. Today's session is very important for each one of us, and it's called Growing Young Gracefully, Aging Healthfully and Successfully in 5780. And we're very happy to welcome Rabbi Dr. Yosef Glassman, MD, who is a geriatrician and who has a lot to share with us about the next years of our lives, as well as the current situation with, which affects each one of us. It is my honor to turn the program over to him. If you have any questions during the program, please feel free to contact me at steinigj at ou.org. That's S-T-E-I-N-I-G-J at ou.org, and I'll be happy to make sure that Rabbi Dr. Glassman sees the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Glassman, and I'm turning the program over to you. Thank you, Judy. It's very exciting to be here with, with all of you at the OU and the SPIRIT program. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I guess we're working okay. So this is my first time presenting like this online. I usually like to go in front of people live, as we all do. I uh, have like to have live interaction, but here we are. Uh, I guess the advantage of presenting like this certainly is that uh, I can still wear uh, my pajama pants, uh, but also the fact that I can look straight at the screen and uh, look at you at the same time. So that makes the teleprompting a lot easier. Uh, certainly, um, I, I, I titled this Growing Young Gracefully and not Growing Old Gracefully, not to be cute necessarily, but to uh, emphasize the fact that our souls always remain young. Um, our neshama is always young. It should stay young. And we should always feel that it is young because that is the essence of our soul. It is young. Our bodies may age, but our, still, our souls remain young. And I want to focus on that. My day job, by the way, is a, a geriatrician. My ger geriatrics is my specialty. And I practice mostly in the hospital in Lakewood and the surrounding areas. Uh, my title of rabbi is more of a freelance title. Um, but I will try to pepper some Torah into this as well. Uh, the topics that I'm going to discuss today are maximizing life expectancy in the United States and Israel. And I will have a focus on Israel, comparing the two countries, and to see why, ultimately, as we all know, for many reasons, Israel is the place to be. Um, and I will also talk about a very hot topic right now called medical cannabis safety and efficacy in aging. Certainly medical cannabis is a hot topic around the United States and the world, particularly in Israel. And we're gonna get into some of that as well uh, and how that has become mainstreamed and for a very good reason. Uh, and then finally, uh, even though we'd like to avoid talking about COVID-19, we'll have to deal with it ultimately in the end. And I'm going to give you some updates about COVID-19 in both the United States and Israel. I've had the uh, uh, opportunity, I should say, educational opportunity, uh, medical opportunity to care for patients with COVID-19 in Lakewood and around, around the New York City area. Uh, and learned quite a bit uh, from taking care of these uh, patients, these special patients. And... Uh, um, and I hope I can share some insights about that and how to avoid COVID-19 and how to um, do well, if God forbid one does get that. It did hit the Jewish community quite hard. Uh, I, did go, I did get it myself, in fact, and thank God uh, came through. So I'll give you some strategies for that. Uh, so first we'll start about maximizing life expectancy in the United States and in Israel. We should all know that the United States, and uh, in the United States, women live average to 81.65 years, and men live 76.61 years on average. Uh, the United States is the 46th highest life expectancy in the world. Israel, on the other hand, does 
a lot better, a little better. Whoops. How did that happen? Okay, sorry. Um, so women live up to almost 85 years and men up almost 82 years. It's the 12th highest in the world. It does better than the United States. And, and I'll get into some of the reasons as to why that might be the case. So what are the factors determining uh, longevity? Uh, certainly diet. Um, Mediterranean diet has been proven over the past 20 plus years in multiple, multiple medical studies to be a superior diet. Uh, and I don't just say that because I'm biased towards the Mediterranean region. Indeed, it is scientifically proven uh, to uh, increase longevity, uh, limiting the, the essence of it essentially is focusing on fruits and vegetables, uh, fish as protein, uh, as the main protein versus poultry, eggs and cheese, and limiting meats and sweets to very uh, a low amount. Certainly wine factors in, in moderation, of course. Lots of water, as we always hear. Uh, legumes are a big factor. Uh, beans, nuts, legumes, seeds. We all know hummus is a very popular item in the Middle East, and it certainly confers benefits there. Uh, not only is the Mediterranean diet superior in terms of longevity, it is uh, has been proven to uh, be one of the best weight loss diets as well and maintenance. So is, interestingly, Israel has the least amount of diet related disease in the world. So to Israel tops the world in many things, many statistics. This is one of them that we can add to the list. Least amount of diet related disease in the world. So following the Mediterranean diet is certainly not a bad idea. Uh, exercising three times a week and maintaining a healthy weight. This is an obvious healthy weight, meaning uh, ideal BMI around 21. I can't practice what I preach on this one. I'm certainly not at 21 yet. I'm working on my Mediterranean diet though, and hopefully we'll get to 146 very soon. Uh, what are other factors determining longevity? Uh, as demonstrated by this uh, sign in school, by this uh, public school sign in Teaneck, this is a real sign, by the way, where school is spelled incorrectly during this current uh, shutdown, sadly. I don't know if it was a joke or if that was uh, done on purpose. In any case, um, or by accident, um, education is a big factor. And brain exercise, we're trying right now to keep our brains healthy, of course. And fascinating, when you're doing your kids and your grandchildren uh, quite a, a, a service by giving them a college degree and ourselves included. College degree uh, confers 10 years more of life, amazingly. Uh, so it's uh, compared to uh, non-high school graduates. Israel has 47% of its citizens uh, achieving a post-secondary school degree. And USA is slightly less than that, less than that at 44%. Optimism is a big factor. Keeping, keeping positive, especially nowadays, is a, is a huge factor. There's what's called the happiness index of subjective well-being. And there have been many studies about this in the world, what's called the World Happiness Report, where people rate their lives zero to 10, where 10 is certainly the best possible life that you can have. Uh, Israel, amazingly, uh, perhaps not amazingly, despite it being at war for many, many years, is the 13th happiest country in the world, subjectively speaking. America, take a guess, 19. Not too bad, but behind Israel. Again, I'm trying to build, build the case for Aliyah from a scientific perspective as well. Um, so what are the other factors? Genetics, I should have started with genetics. They are actually the most powerful in terms of longevity. We can't do anything about those, however. Um, but interestingly, just, to, just so you're aware, uh, if your parents lived long lives, then you are more likely to live long lives, um, despite uh, perhaps other, other activities and environments that we have. Uh, in fact, 85% genetics are 85% accurate, predicting the arrival of a person to the age of 105. There are genetic markers for that. Uh, and this comes, a lot of it comes from Japanese studies. Uh, they live quite a long time. They're one of the top two, if not the, they were the number one. I think Hong Kong is now number one. Um, longevity, longevity is amongst the highest, yet 50% of the men smoke. So, so I certainly don't recommend smoking based on that. But just so people know, you know, you always hear the stories of my uncle smoked until age 102 and he was fine. So I'll smoke too. That doesn't work, uh, but it does work sometimes, certainly if you have good genes.
not predictable, however. Uh, hygiene is big. Um, back in the 1700s, the average life expectancy was only 27, believe it or not. And early, early 20th century, it was only around 40, 45. Uh, so, and this has, a, and the, the fact that we're now in our 80s, 70s and 80s in terms of life expectancy is highly attributable, attributable not only to modern medicine, but to hygiene. That's the, really the big factor that's now running water. Uh, there's a lot more cl uh, cleanliness, um, disinfectants and things like that. That's a huge factor in terms of longevity. Uh, thank God we don't live just until 27. Uh, dental is a really big factor, dental hygiene particularly, because oral bacteria can contribute to heart disease and pneumonia. Certainly pneumonia makes some sense. We might, someone might inhale bacteria from their mouth, but heart disease as well. Many people don't realize that when you brush your teeth, when we brush our teeth, teeth bacteria from the mouth enter the blood. In fact, we become what's called bacteremic. The, the blood is full of bacteria. And if our immune system, Yer Tzashem, is working properly, the uh, body fights that bacteria very quickly. Uh, social connections are huge. The attendance at synagogue, in fact, and social uh, uh, connections are found to be twice as good as exercise. Now, that's not saying you shouldn't exercise, but social connections are huge, as we're all finding, during, finding out the hard way during this uh, pandemic that we lack those social connections, but it is really a factor in longevity and living longer. Uh, fascinating from Israel, uh, tefillin confers lower risk of dying of heart disease because there's better flow to the heart. Um, there are some studies uh, about that, and um, there are some good scientific uh, reasons behind that. So another interesting fact, prayer and uh, tefillin have been proven to increase longevity and lower heart disease rates. My next slide is, sorry about that, we're a little paused here. Oh, here we go. Okay, so uh, alcohol. Um, certainly it is, not, it is not a good idea to entirely abstain from alcohol. Uh, as you can see from this U-shaped graph, someone who I'm showing over here at uh, relative risk, if someone, if someone uh, does not drink any help, alcohol, the rate of uh, risk of death or the rate of death is higher than those who con con consume 20 grams per day. But when that starts to go up to 72, uh, we get back to a higher death rate. And certainly uh, 89, it's, uh, it's even higher. Uh, but a little, a little bit of alcohol per day is, does confer longer life from a scientific perspective. So that's important to know. I certainly would, um, but at the same time, as we all know, the dangers of alcohol are, oops, are here. Uh, we see here that alcohol indeed is the most harmful drug, if you wanna call it a drug, out there. In fact, it causes the most harm to others and the most harm to users, according to a Lancet article in 2010, more than heroin, crack, uh, cocaine, tobacco, and so on, go down the list. Uh, it is the most dangerous drug known to humankind on the earth. Uh, so we do have to do it, keep that in mind and in moderation. Okay, for the next slide. Living until 120, we like to say like Moshe Rabbeinu lived 120, we wanna to live to 120 as well, certainly in good health. Uh, this uh, gentleman, Yisrael Crystal, lived to age 113 in Israel, he was a Holocaust survivor. Died, uh, he passed away recently. <clears throat> Hello, Shalom. He, uh, we want to try to at least get to 120, but if not, you know, at least 100. That's a great website, and uh, there's, the, there's the link. It's called livingto100.com. It's all scientifically proven um, aspects of living, to, getting to 120, and it actually does a calculator for you, putting in your lifestyle and different questions based on the, the items that I just mentioned to you previously of what you may or may not do during the day and predicts, predicts more or less uh, how likely you are to get to age 100. So that's an interesting thing you can try later. And it's all evidence-based. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and try to bring it back a little bit. 
Um, this topic is a, is a love of mine. It's very interesting. I've been involved in uh, the prescription of medical cannabis for elderly, for old, older folks since 2012 in Massachusetts and now in New Jersey. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit about medical cannabis safety and efficacy in aging. The picture that you see here is a woman in Israel actually on a kibbutz. And there, as you might see on the picture on the right there, they're giving her cannabis leaves, ground cannabis leaves with her yogurt. And this, uh, there's a, there was a great piece on, about uh, this woman on CNN where she was literally confined to a wheelchair and started taking medical cannabis. And this is just one story, of course, where she was now able to walk where she was confined to a wheelchair before simply by virtue of the medical cannabis. And I'll get into the reasons as to why that might be the case. Uh, well, let's talk about just a briefly about the background of cannabis. It, a, it is native to Asia and the Middle East, certainly the Middle East being a part of Asia. It's a fundamental herb, one out of the top 50 fundamental herbs in Chinese medicine, and that's the word for cannabis there in Chinese, you can see on the right. It was used in ancient Egypt for 3,000 plus years for hemorrhoids and eye pain, Sim and similarly in ancient Greece, and there's the word for cannabis in Greek, ear pain, it was used for ear pain and obstructions. Uh, and indeed it was found in Israel as well, uh, in, in, uh, in remains that were found in Beit Shemesh from a young lady who was 14 years old and died in childbirth. They found seven glass vessels of hashish, which is a concentrated cannabis resin. If someone didn't know what hashish is. That is a, that's the common version of the, the drug found in the Middle East. Seven gram mixture was found on her belly, basically, or nearby. Uh, this is six, dated 1600 years ago in the Amoraic era. So it was used as an ancient anesthesia before, the, before we had general anesthesia. And it was indeed safe during childbirth. And I'll tell you why soon. The Rambam did prescribe medical marijuana, believe it or not. He, uh, qu he's quoted as saying, cannabis oil provides benefit to upper respiratory disease, particularly mild respiratory disease earaches, heals chronic ear illnesses, and dissolves waxy obstructions. So there's the Rambam, so you can certainly feel good about that. He didn't have the, uh, he didn't have the evidence, certainly the scientific studies per se, but he certainly had a lot of empiric evidence treating patients in Egypt and beyond. So I don't know if uh, Bob Dylan was a student of the Rambam, uh, but he certainly was a student of uh, cannabis, and I can't say this was medical cannabis per se, but he is attributed, Bob Dylan or, or Bob Zimmerman or his Hebrew name Shabtai Zissel ben Avraham was, uh, was accredited by, by John Lennon for sharing cannabis the first time with him uh, in, the, um, in the book called The Bible of the Beatles, I believe it was called. In any case, so Jews have been involved in cannabis, were involved in cannabis in the 60s, as you may know, and uh, there were the main organizers of Woodstock, as many people may know as well, were Jewish folks, uh, where cannabis was a prominent feature. The, the right side, pic the right picture of Bob Dylan playing the harmonica, by the way, was a Chabad uh, fundraiser, which is sort of interesting there. He was wearing his yarmulke. Now, while the Jews in America were sort of experimenting uh, recreationally with cannabis, the Jews in Israel were doing some scientific studies and figuring out what is this plant all about. And in fact, the, uh, the famed researcher, Raphael Meshulam, we see pictured on the right, discovered at Hebrew University the active ingredient of hashish, which is, again, concentrated cannabis resin. And he, just, he was the person who discovered, the scientist who discovered THC, which is the main active ingredient in cannabis. There, there are actually over 120 cannabinoids in the plant that are unique to the plant, which makes it very fascinating. And he was the one who discovered THC. And you probably heard of CBD. That is also becoming very popular as well. Israel, according to this U.S. News article, is actually called, it was called the Holy Land of Medical Marijuana, and why? Um, certainly, the, the Dr. Meshulam's research was instrumental in that. 
But the, the interesting thing is that the United States has been sending, the NIH particularly, has been sending money to Israel for the past 50 plus years at the, at the rate of about $100,000 per year for researching medical marijuana. Now, why in Israel? Not only do they have the, the know-how, but there, it's also a very much more uh, liberal place in terms of allowing the research. In the United States, it's been banned. It was a, 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 uh, it's been banned for many years, uh, even for research showing, apparently, according to the US government, has no medical benefit. Officially, I think that's changed now. Schedule one drug. Now that has been lifted, I believe. In any case, Israel tops the world in cannabis uh, in several in several areas. Number one, it has the largest patient database safety and research in the entire world. It has the largest per capita use for medication, medical marijuana, in the entire world. It has the largest indoor cannabis cultivation facilities in the world and it has the highest public funding per capita. So the Israeli government, in addition to the money coming from the NIH, is funding medical marijuana research as itself. And why? Why are we finding that it, it helps in many realms, in many, in many diseases? Because the endocannabinoid system, essentially, which is basically cannabinoid receptors, we found, Dr. Mishula particularly has found that there are many receptors, CB1 receptors, CB2 receptors, all over the body in every part of the body. So in other words, uh, there are, the body is built by Kadosh Baruch Hu with many, many receptors uh, ready to accept the cannabinoids. Now we make our own cannabinoids as well, so it's not, it's not dependent on the plant per se. We make our own cannabinoids, uh, called, there's something called anandamide that the, that the body produces, it's very similar. Uh, but it affects every aspect of the entire body, including the eye, the lungs, the brain. It's the most famous, of course. But it's the largest receptor system in the human body, uh, and we do not learn this yet in medical school, fascinating enough. But it may indeed be unlocking, it may be the key in unlocking the human condition because it is so ubiquitous. Um, there are multiple medical uses. We know uh, it is a bronchodilator. A vasodilator, meaning it lowers the blood pressure. It's an immune model modulator, affecting the immune system and boosting the immune system. It's a bone modulator, increasing bone strength in some studies. A nerve modulator, slow, slowing conduction uh, when necessary. And it's an eye pressure modulator, so it's, it's, it can be helpful in glaucoma, as they found in Jamaica in the 1960s and 70s. And what's fascinating is there is some evidence showing that it may help in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but you think it might be the opposite. But indeed, uh, there is an Israeli slash German study from three years ago that showed that cannabis may in fact reverse brain aging. They did some studies in mice that were um, uh, Methuselah mice that were basically aged mice that showed that they could revert their brain function to uh, several months old which is quite amazing. Now, is cannabis safe? Well, we, um, this is a valid concern because certainly we don't want people abusing it. We don't want people getting into car accidents and things like that, and that certainly is a real danger. Uh, but it is, I have to say, is the least lethal drug that exists to humankind, uh, fascinatingly. Uh, if you can see this, this is a toxicity chart, and you see cannabis is at the top, and that basically means that you need a very large dose to make it lethal. If you go to the bottom, you can see heroin, which is the most lethal drug that we have currently uh, in the world. Uh, a small, very small amount can, can stop breathing, can make people die. Alcohol is right there, you can see. Uh, it's in the uh, near toxic, in the, in the near poison range. It can be easily made into a poison, sorry. Um, and even, you know, tobacco. Caffeine, aspirin, cannabis is safer in terms of toxicity in the body than even aspirin. Again, I don't recommend people going out giving it to their teenagers, obviously, that's not what I'm promoting here, uh, or even to try it recreationally per se, but it is indeed not a lethal drug as people sometimes think. Um, in fact, the National Academies report 2017, which is an independent panel of medical experts who examine the evidence for cannabis benefits show that cannabis effect effectively treats chronic pain, 
chemotherapy-induced nausea and spasticity. There's enough evidence showing those three for sure. There is no evidence of cannabis overdose deaths. There's never been, this is an amazing thing for any drug, there's never been an overdose death from cannabis. Now, there are I'm not saying there are not car accidents. There certainly are, and there are other accidents as well. But there's no overdose deaths. Uh, and the reason being, as you'll see here, we know that the, mo the most uh, cannabinoid receptors are found in the brain, and that can indeed affect reaction time, fluidity of, moment, of movement, memory and coordination, and, and certainly pleasure. And this is why people take it recreationally, of course, um, and why it can be dangerous as well because of the lack of reaction time of people, God forbid, drive and so on. But on the good news side, in terms of the brain, at least, not only did I mention that it may slow down aging and may reverse aging even in the brain, but there's sparse densities in the breathing centers. And that, what that means to us is that people cannot overdose. Where we know that heroin, oxycodone, all the opioids, people simply stop breathing if they take too much. If people take too much of cannabis, they will not stop breathing, which is quite a, a positive in terms of a safety profile. So on that note, it may be an answer to the opioid crisis. Uh, in fact, in states where medical marijuana legalization uh, occurred, there's been a 23% decrease in, in hospitalizations related to opioid dependence or abuse. So people have sort of gone over to cannabis instead of opioids and there's a drop in 13, by 13% of opioid overdoses. Uh, a study of hospitalizations in 27 states over around uh, 16, 17 years show that where nine states had medical marijuana policies, there was a decline in opioid use or deaths in medical cannabis states. So that's very exciting. It's, and it's the fifth study to show the same thing. So it's quite uh, validated. Um, in terms of prescription drugs, uh, studies of Medicare Part D enrollees, 2010 to 2013, in states that have a medical cannabis programs, the use of prescription drugs dropped, and there was a drop of $165.2 million in prescription spending per year, which is quite a significant amount. Uh, and a, a nice Israeli study shows that therapeutic, therapeutic use of cannabis is safe and efficacious in the elderly population, and cannabis use may in fact decrease the use of other prescription medicines, including opioids, as I mentioned. And that's in the European Journal of Internal Medicine. That's an Israeli study that we can be proud of. Um, <clears throat> I'll switch gears a little bit to cannabis in the Torah. I've promised a little Torah here. And many people are shocked when they see this text, but there it is. A, one of, a, a rabbi sent this to me, a friend of mine. And you can see it says, Abal Alei Cannabis, Hanikra Kanab, Ochrinuto, the Mitzrayim, the Meshacher, the Omrim, Shahu Mesameach. So it says that the leaves of cannabis, which is called Kanab in Arabic, is eaten in Egypt and it's intoxicating, and people say that it makes one happy. One eats it raw in a particular amount, and there are places where they make clothes out of it, similar to how they make them linen. This is the Rad Baz, who was commenting, commenting on the Mishnah Torah of the Rambam. Uh, and indeed, the Rambam talks about cannabis not as a medicine, not medically in this particular text in the Mishnah Torah, but as, a, um, as an issue in kilayim, or mixing, mixing plants. So the Rad Baz was a contemporary of Yosef Karo. In fact, he sat in the same basin with Yosef Karo, the composer of the Shulchan Aruch, and this is, these are his words. Okay. Uh, indeed, as the Radvaz mentioned, cannabis clothing was in fashion. This is a talit of cannabis, and the talit of cannabis is talked about in many locations. Certainly, today we might refer to it as hemp, but hemp and cannabis are indeed the same thing. It's meant, the cannabis is mentioned in the oral Torah, in the in the Talmud where it says, as it is taught, if one's field is sown with cannabis and loof, another type of plant, one should not sow another seed on top of them as they last for three years. Apparently the, the roots of cannabis are uh, very long and strong and we do not want to mix, mix them with the vineyard fruits. That's from Masechet Menachot. 
And Rashi translates cannabis as kanab, which is again the Arabic form of the Arabic word for cannabis. So it's the same exact thing as we're talking about before. Why are Jews growing cannabis other than for clothing? Interestingly, for Sabbath, for Shabbat, for Shabbat wicks, uh, one would use one from the, what is the requirement for a wick, a Shabbat wick? It has, the light has to stick to the wick itself uh, and cannot jump around. That is one of the requirements of a Shabbat wick. Uh, and the examples that the Shulchan Aruch gives are flax, cotton, and cannabis. That is, and in fact, the Shulchan Aruch does talk about that cannabis is indeed the most preferable of all the wicks, olive oil and cannabis wicks. So that is the, if you want the top of the top Shabbat candle, that is it, according to Torah. Clothing for the deceased. Rav Papa said, and today everyone is accustomed to bury the dead in plain garments, even in Tzreda. Tzreda is another word that the Talmud used in Aramaic for cannabis, says Rashi. So people used to, the Jews used to bury the dead in cannabis clothing. And what's fascinating here is there's a, a connection where it says here in Ketubo, uh, Rabbi Chia Bar Yosef said, in the future, the righteous will sprout and arise in Yerushalayim, as it says, and may they blossom out of the city like the grass. And now you don't see any direct references to cannabis here, but we know that they were buried in cannabis clothing. And indeed the word mitbatzpitzim, mitbatzpitzim, is related to the root beats boots. And Rashi talks about that as being cannabis again. So there's a, certainly a connection between uh, death and resurrection. Uh, Yosef, uh, it says in the Torah, uh, and Hash, uh, Rashi says this is a Dabar Hashibu, this is an important, he's wearing an important garment, some type of important garment. And Dasa Skenim says, put the English there, this kind of linen was considered extremely valuable in Egypt. Furthermore, it's most likely that the fabric mentioned here was cannabis. So it really has a, quite a prominent role in Judaism, which we have certainly forgot about. <clears throat> Here's a picture from the Ari Synagogue in Svan. Uh, research out of Israel shows that indeed there is benefit, as I mentioned before, cancer in children, uh, colitis, movement disorders, Crohn's disease, autism is a fresh new study of, out of Israel coming out about autism, appetite in geriatric patients, pain in the elderly, as I mentioned before, and believe it or not, there is studying cannabis for COVID-19 in Israel at this time. So now, as much as I want to avoid talking about COVID-19, we'll have to talk about it eventually. How are they looking at COVID? What's the relationship between cannabis and COVID-19 and how it may or may not help? It seems like it would be frivolous, but certainly we're trying many different drugs with COVID-19. I mean, we're throwing the book at COVID-19 because we don't know what will work and we're seeing what sticks. Uh, we're trying vitamin C, zinc, and the like. Um, in any case, the research currently underway is uh, at Ichilov Hospital, one of the top hospitals in, in Israel. So I think it's number two after um, Tel Shomer. In any case, they're looking at the effect of CBD extracts on infected patients. As you know, CBD is over the counter here in every state in the United States. It's the non-psychoactive component, the anti-inflammatory component of cannabis plant. And they're looking at that simply because it is, has been shown already to be anti-inflammatory. There's been work for many years already on cannabinoids against hepatitis C and Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus. Uh, Dr. Yoshua Maor from uh, Yerushalayim is, uh, has been working on uh, cannabis and its applications against viruses for years. And there's some great studies that he has put out on that. Uh, it's also a bronchodilator, as, a bronchodilator as the Rambam mentioned or hinted to before. It's known to be, in fact, similar to albuterol in asthma. It does the same effects, according to a nice article from the Archives of Internal Medicine back in 2007. This is fascinating to me that Canadian research, researchers at the University of Lethbridge uh, show that cannabis may block up to 70% of the virus, of the COVID-19 virus, from entering the cells by blocking an entrance protein. 
Now, this might have some amazing uh, implications if it indeed works. Now, this is just a very small study, and it's in the lab. Uh, but if this, is, if this proves to be true, it may be, in fact, a valid use for prevention of the COVID-19 entering one's cells, which is very exciting. Okay. So now I'm going to switch over to the COVID impact in the United States. Certainly we're all fully aware, too much aware of this disease. And I want to give you some perspectives on it because there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of fear about it, and, and perhaps rightly so, but perhaps even it shouldn't be so scary as, it, as it's made out to be. I don't want to minimize certainly uh, dying from it, God forbid, but um, I'm gonna to try to put this on perspective. Now we know today from the headlines that we're nearing 100,000 deaths in the United States out of a total of nearly 1.7 million known cases of COVID-19. And if you think about that, 1.7 million cases, known cases, almost 2 million, is very small compared to our entire population. I, I have to struggle to believe that that is not an accurate number. We have not uh, tested everybody. And I'm sure there are many, many people that are asymptomatic particularly children or very mildly symptomatic if they're children or younger folks. So that 1.7 million total known cases is likely very low, not accurate. Uh, so that's just an important caveat. Uh, we're just currently discovering cases at 20,000 per day, which is 5,000 per 1 million people. Uh, only 0.5% of the United States United States population is infected, as I mentioned right now, earlier. Now that means for us that 6% of known infected have passed away versus influenza, which is only 0.05%, which is why it makes everybody so scared because that's very, very high uh, compared to flu. But the reality is, again, we don't know the denominator. We don't know the denominator of how many people are truly infected. If the denominator is much higher, if let's say, you know, you know, 10 million people have really been infected, not just 1.7, that 6% goes, goes down. And in fact, the CDC has just come out with new re-estimates that the true fatality rate is only 0.626%, including asymptomatic folks. It's, it's quite low, lower than what we think. Um, certainly one person dying is terrible, uh, but it, is, uh, it's not, it may not justify the panic that is currently underway. That said, the rate of people dying is alarming. I can't deny that, but the, num the total numbers are, could be potentially lower than what we think. The rate of death is highest at the age of 60, 85 and older, certainly over 60. It goes up, but 85 is the highest, and it goes up with age. It's rare to pass away from this disease under the age of 15, although I have seen young folks. I don't take care of pediatrics. I have seen 30-year-olds quite ill and 20-year-olds quite ill uh, in my hospital, and it's certainly a serious disease when, it, when someone does come from, to the hospital and acquire oxygen, but uh, it is much less likely to occur if someone's under 15, under 20. Um, it just interesting statistics, painting a picture. May 5th of this year had the most deaths per day at 2,701. And the current death rate is approximately 1,000 a day in the United States. Okay. Well, I didn't know this before looking it up, but um, the current death rate, the death rate prior to COVID-19 was 7,500 a day of other causes. Just, just to put that in perspective of how many people are dying from COVID-19 and how many people die from, say, heart attacks, strokes, cancer, and the like. Again, that's, that was 7,500 per day of regular other causes, okay? Now at its peak, this red arrow here, COVID was up here, was the number one cause of death in the United States uh, a few weeks ago, okay? Now it's right here under cancer in terms of numbers per day, okay? So, people, so heart, heart attacks, people die at this rate, 1,774 per day, and people don't realize that. Uh, cancer's here, 1,641. And now again, as I mentioned, COVID is around 1,000 a day that people are dying. So it's scary um, because it is quite a high rate, but it is dropping. That's the good news. It is dropping. 
And there are some promising therapies coming out. Uh, we see remdesivir, which is an IV drug, usually used in intensive care units. It's showing uh, that there are four days less in the hospital for folks who are hospitalized. There's some promise there. Hydrochloroquine, which you hear a lot about, that's, is equivocal. There's no benefit per se and, uh, and may indeed cause harm potentially. Um, there, are, there are good studies, I believe, out of Columbia that show that it's equivocal. It's, it's like placebo. Um, Aronofin, which is gold, essentially giving somebody gold. Gold has been found like an arthritis. You give someone gold. It is anti-inflammatory, and there could be some promise there. Again, this is not a cure. Convalescent antibodies, we've given to that. We've given convalescent antibodies. People who have a disease, we collected the plasma and give it to folks uh, to give them an immune boost, essentially, their antibodies. And there are several studies going on in that. I'm, I'm part of one in Lakewood. And that is looking problem, but again, there are no full results back yet on that. Anecdotally, we give zinc, vitamin C, D, thiamine, anything that doesn't hurt and could potentially help. Stem cells have been shown to help in some Israeli studies. That's, that's going to be down the pike, I believe. A lot of other drugs, I'm not going to go through them all. A lot of things are being studied. And what's very exciting, there are eight companies at the head of the pack of the immunization race, getting an immunization out there. Uh, four of them happen to be in China. They're sort of ahead of the game. Uh, but hundreds are looking. In Boston, there's, there's also an mRNA vaccine, a vaccine that, that targets the, uh, that, that injects mRNA or RNA, you know, genetic material from the virus, and that's coming out of Boston, and that's showing, I believe, the most promise so far in the States. We'll see where that goes. How's Israel doing with COVID-19? Yeah, amazingly, actually. Uh, Israel, you know, well, we shouldn't have any deaths, of course. Uh, Israel is experiencing only 24 deaths per 1 million people, which is versus the United States. The United States, which has 299 deaths per 1 million people. And, and Israel's population, as you know, is 8.6 million people. Israel's death rate is approximately 10 times less than the United States for COVID-19. And and you can compare Israel, as we often do, to New Jersey, because similar size, similar population. Israel only has 200, had 279 deaths, last time I checked, and maybe a little more now, as of the 24th, compared to New Jersey, similar size, 11,000. That's quite, that's quite a statistic, how, how well Israel's doing in terms of fighting this virus. Now, again, of course, it's all from HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it's all from Hashem, as to why Israel's doing uh, better but certainly we took some human measures as well um, that have been proven to be effective. Uh, at its peak in Israel, March 31st, 729 people uh, per day were infected. Now it's only five to 20 are infected. Uh, approximately 14,000 out of 17,000 were infected, have recovered, 82%, versus the United States, only 20% have gotten better. That doesn't make sense that we're only 20% in the United States, but those are the numbers that we have. I believe it's just not testing. We're not testing enough uh, to know what the real number is. And Israel has a, you know, smaller, has tighter statistics for tracking and monitoring, has a lot of intelligence out there on monitor, monitoring folks for, for better or for worse. How did Israel do it? It swiftly banned international flights. There were strict quarantines for citizens entering the country for two weeks. They had to go straight to a hotel or a, um, uh, you know, a loan facility quarantine for two weeks coming in. No city to city travel for most holidays. They could not leave their city and it was very highly strictly enforced. They were tracked, they tracked quarantine violators with cell phone data and military intelligence technology. There were Corona hotels for affected individuals and families and there were Corona wards in the hospitals. Now we have Corona wards here as well, dedicated floors, but they were very good at uh, isolating folks. They took elderly out of hot spots. They moved them physically out of B'nai Brak and other places into areas to keep them safe. <clears throat> Based on 76 parameters in a study by the Deep Knowledge, by Deep Knowledge Venture shows that Israel is in fact the safest place in the world during this pandemic. So if you haven't thought about Aliyah before, this may be your time to think about it for medical reasons or other, many other better reasons than that, but there's one. Uh, in any case, how do we prevent it? What are some tips I'm going to give you? Again, don't panic. That's the number one thing. The main thing is 
God is still in control of every situation. There's no need to panic. And in fact, anecdotally, I saw the people in the hospital that did worse with this disease, frankly, were the most anxious. In other words, if they were anxious, they invariably did worse with this. Even the 30-year-olds, I, I, I took care of 30-year-old patients. That were, the more anxious they were, the more difficulty they had breathing. And it could say, well, maybe they had difficulty breathing, so they were anxious. Yes, that's potentially true as well, but the main thing is staying calm. I can tell you from my own personal experience that staying calm really got me through it. Uh, certainly we have to hand wash all the time, Purell, things of that nature. Masks are important, getting out there into the public sphere, social distancing, eating healthy, exercise, getting some fresh air, maybe CBD oil, maybe we'll see that down the pike as well. But the main thing is, you know, as we get older, um, it's still important to get outside. It's important to get outside. I wouldn't go into a crowded public space per se if you're not fully masked, and maybe not at all. If you can avoid it, avoid it. Avoid those public spots for now until we have better guidance and better, uh, hand, a better handle on this and what it's really going to do in the future. It is the deadly disease the older we get. I can't say that it's not. It is very aggressive. It is very contagious. But at that, at, you know, again, the more you do the regular social distancing, the mass, uh, the better off we can be with this. Uh, but don't, don't stop your life entirely. That's, the, that's my main message for people as we get older. Rabbi Dr. Glassman, can I interrupt for one second with a question? Sure. Um, with, with what you were saying about social distancing and, and, and masks and all that, what should be at present or going forward uh, as all the different states and cities and everybody's opening up to whatever degree they're opening up. Uh, in the demographic that's watching this program today, where, where should we be at? You know, do everybody's been, you know, not seeing their kids and all that. Is that still where we're, where we're going to be or are there any changes that you can envision? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, yeah, see, we, given that we're such social beings and we want to see our families, it's a really tough thing because, you know, if a child has, the, has the, the COVID virus, they may often not know and they could still be uh, infectious. So somebody could come visit their, their grandparent, per se, a child, and not know they have the, the virus. And then the next thing we know, God forbid, the, the grandparent gets it. So it's very problematic to say, okay, we'll just get back together. I think it's very, I don't know if I have a great recommendation on how to do that safely, but that said, I do not say, I do not think that we have to isolate entirely. In other words, I think people can see their families um, with, if we have an, uh, an, an, an older relative, we should all wear masks, particularly, um, well, everyone, I think, if we're, gonna, if we're gonna take the risk, we should wear masks if we're, you know, in a close proximity. Um, but we shouldn't avoid each other. I think we're, we're, we're all uh, dealing with this reality of everyone wearing masks. I never thought I could get used to something like this. I'm sure nobody could. They're coming out in all kinds of fashions now, uh, designer and so on and so forth. But I think that it's no reason to not get together. I think we have to, we're social beings. We, we thrive on social interaction. So I think that, I don't have a general guideline, but I, I would say it's not a good idea to totally isolate from everybody. I think it's not healthy. Does that answer the question or could I? I, yeah, I, think, I, I think you've answered it as best as anybody could answer it now. Right, it's still a big guess. It's, it's a risk, but you know, some of the, sometimes it's a risk that you have, sort of have to take. So I'm yeah, happy to get a email, que uh, you know, email questions and other questions. And again, one of my big things is encouraging folks to make Aliyah even uh, over the age of 60. And I'm always happy to discuss, discuss Aliyah as well. And uh, as you can see, there are a lot of good medical reasons and dietary reasons to make Aliyah. Uh, certainly we have the religious reasons already there in front of us. Uh, but uh, I, I certainly something to, to something to think about during this time of crisis. And I don't know when we're going to think about it so seriously, other, you know, more than now. Well, thank you so much, Rabbi. Um, Rabbi Dr. Glassman, I think everybody learned a lot, a lot of things to think about, um, strategies. Uh, the cannabis piece, I think, was fascinating to all of us. And so thank you so much 
Um, we'll be sharing your contact information later on when we send out the recording. Is that okay? That's absolutely. I'm happy to take questions and to uh, continue the conversation. Wonderful. Okay, well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I want to remind you that there is no class, no session this Thursday, Erev Yantif. Um, so we'll be, and I'll be seeing everybody next week when we get back to let's get moving with exercise. This will be the fourth time that Sandy Lev is going to be giving us some time and I'm sure everyone's looking forward to that. So uh, just check your emails or check OUcommunity.org in order to register because as we always tell you, every session you have to register separately. Our presenter registers separately, I register separately. That's what we have to do these days with uh, the Zoom security. So check your emails that you should be getting an email Sunday or Monday morning next week. That'll tell you about it. Um, so I want to wish everybody an early, uh, wish you a good Shabbos, a good Yentif. Uh, stay safe, and be healthy. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you, good Shabbos. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.